Hello, my name is Harald Sack. And I'm Tabea Tietz. And this is Knowledge Graphs. This is lecture number one, Knowledge Representation with Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about linked data and the web of data. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look at the basic architecture of the web. So we start with addressing and identifying things. And this, of course, in the traditional web is done via a URL, which is a uniform res resource locator. This gives you the address of something, like for example here Fitzkarlsruhe. The second component in the basic web ar architecture is HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and this is for communication. There, of course, you need an address to communicate things. And as a communication protocol, HTTP uh, delivers the information from a web server to a web client. And finally, what you need, of course, to encode your information, to represent your information, that's HTML on the traditional web. That's the hypertext transfer, a uh, hypertext markup language. With that, of course, you can express something which is then rendered and displayed within a web page as you see it in the browser. So here you see a, a small example of HTML. Okay, but how now does it look in the web of data? If we look at the semantic web technology stack. So let's take a look at the basic architecture in the web of data. And in the web of data, it's very important to identify things. And we don't just want to identify web pages. We want to basically identify everything. We want to reference everything and we want to reference statements about everything. And this is why we need uniform resource identifiers, URIs, as you can see here on the, in the bottom layer of the semantic web technology stack. And then very similar to the traditional web, we also need HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol for communication. And then instead of HTML, we need RDF, the resource description framework as a exchange format, but also representation language to encode our resources. And everything together then forms the web of data. So we identify resources with URI, we communicate uh, resources and provide access to resources with HTTP, and we encode the resources in RDF. Okay, so now let's define what the web of data is. And the web of data, as we have now learned, is an upgrade of the traditional web of documents. Simply because we do not necessarily only represent documents, we also have representation of completely different things of our real world within the web of data. And of course we have data sets, and data structures, data resources. And it's the web imagined as a huge decentralized database, or in our case even a knowledge base, since we have also ontologies as formal knowledge representations beyond or behind the stuff that we are representing there on the web of data, and thereby it becomes machine understandable data. Please distinguish here machine readable data from machine, machine understandable data. Every HTML page is machine readable since there is a parser who, which understands how to parse HTML. But machine understandable really means that of course, then the machine is able to correctly interpret the information that is given to the machine by the formal knowledge representation. Overall, if you want to define that, there is already a definition from 1998 by Tim Berners-Lee, which states, the web of human readable document is being merged with a web of machine understandable data. And the potential of the mixture of humans and machines working together and communicating through the web could be immense. And of course, this is the motivation that drives us forward. Okay, now, how do we access that web of data? Usually, or basically, it's, it's a web of very many interrelated um, data sets. And these data sets, of course, are also um, uh, represented together with ontologies, which means we have there the meaning encoded in an explicit way, and they are to get to, uh, to connected together. Now, if the user wants to access exactly that kind of web, what happens there? These data sets, of course, don't have, let's say, dedicated web pages encoded in HTML. Usually what you have there, 
you have intelligent infrastructure services that are able to read these data sets and that are able to aggregate them and relate them with each other. And on your own side, so behind your browser, there is something like a personal assistant. And this personal assistant that is using these intelligent infrastructure services, collecting data, and then, for example, filling out templates, creating virtual web pages on the flight from the data that has been accessed in the web of data. So everything there is virtual. There is nothing like uh, these traditional database templates that you see here that reflect to a single database. But of course, they only then connect to these intelligent infrastructure services, which then make use of the vast collection of data that is out there on the web. So the advantage is clear. So information can be automatically selected aggregated, remixed, and as well published according to your personal preferences. So this is the way how exactly the web in the end then works. So now let's take a look at the size of the web of data at the moment. On the right here, you can see the linked open data cloud. Um, and this is from January 2023. And it visualizes around 1,588 linked open data sets, which are also then connected to each other. And in 2021, Common Crawl also reported more than 8 million websites, more than 700 million URLs, more than 7 billion entities, and also more than 37 billion triples. So this is quite a lot. But what makes linked data now really so special? Let's take a step back and look again at traditional vapor, uh, data and traditional data access in the web. So usually what you wanted to do there is, of course, you had here your web client. And of course, if you wanted to access some data, you had to address first the web server. And on the web server, probably there was a page template and something like that. And the data that has been filled within the template then was uh, taken from a database that is somewhere, you know, uh, connected to the web server, but there was a specific API, like for example, JDBC, by which then the connection between database and web server was handled. And of course, this also was kind of a bottleneck. The problem there was, um, if you then wanted to connect to a specific database, you had to use this web API, so the application programming interface there. And of course, data exchange requires their specific formats. And uh, uh, of course, you could build mashups on top of that, which means you were using then several APIs together and were creating an application that was using several APIs. But the problem you had with that, of course, is um, as soon as one of the data providers changes its API, you had, of course, to adapt your entire application again and probably again and again and again, if the data schema is also changing and stuff like that. And this, of course, was a huge drawback since um, it's rather costly and not really effective to maintain these kind of data mashups in the traditional web of data. What happened usually is, and you also know that, that the single databases that I could formally access or still can access via a web API, they are locked up into small data islands. So for example, if you have a web API to access, let's say, um, Amazon as an e-commerce provider, you can't use the same API to connect to Google to then make use of the, the Google search results, for example. You need different APIs. And as soon as they are, again, changing, of course, you have to adapt your software. The problem there is other applications usually cannot access data outside their own scope of their own API. And this, of course, is a major drawback that we have to get rid of. So how can we now avoid such isolated data islands? When we apply linked data technology, we want to publish structured data on the web. And we draw connections from one data source to data from another data source. And what helps us here really is this so-called linked data layer. That means um, we have kind of a generic interface. We encode our data in RDF and provide access to the data via HTTP. And yeah, this sums basically up the linked data principles. And it's just four rules you basically have to follow. 
The first is use your eyes as names for things. Very easy. The second one is use HTTP your eyes so that people can really look up those names. And then when someone looks up a URI, provide useful information and use the standards. For example, RDF or Sparkle as they are also recommended by the W3C. And then last but not least, include also links to other URIs so that they can discover more things. In practice, of course, there are several stages how your linked open data can benefit. So this is a, a standard five-star schema that has been provided also by, by Tim Berners-Lee and it's a five-star criteria for linked open data on the web. Let's go quickly through it. So one star means your data is available on the web, whatever format is in, whatever license. So it might be that this is completely proprietary. Like, for example, PDF, it's available on the, lab, on the web, but it's, of course, you have to, to obey a license and it's a special kind of format that it's not explicitly and automatically accessible. Or an Excel sheet, for example. Then you have two-star linked open data. You make your stuff available in a machine-readable structured data format, like, for example, if you use CSV, for example. Or, or not even that, so it can be proprietary still, so it can be Excel, for example, but it's a machine-readable structured data format, not PDF anymore. Then three-star, then we say goodbye to proprietary format, so then it's non-proprietary, CSF instead of Excel. And of course, you can do be even better than CSV, so comma separated values. You can go for four stars, and there you are using the open standards from W3C, like RDF and Sparkle, to identify things, and people can point to it and can look it up. That's four star. And to make it complete, five star, all above, of course, only if my data then is also linked to other data, then it's most useful. Because then exactly these kind of interconnections, what is identical to something else, what is related to something else, comes into play. And then this semantic web and the web of linked open data comes to life. Yes, and next to the five star linked open data, we can also take a look at the FAIR principles, which are guidelines to make sure that data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. But the good news is if we are using linked data and semantic web technologies, our data already comply to these FAIR principles. And um, we will come back later to these FAIR principles in the lecture and we will refer to that. And this concludes the first week of our Knowledge Graph course and we hope to see you in the next week in Basic Knowledge Graph Infrastructure.